G'day. Welcome back. Boys. Awesome. Hey, Mitch. Awesome. How are you? Good to see you. you Thanks too. for coming along. I hope everyone's been paying attention to that incredibly rare planetary alignment that's been happening. Uh, not this morning, yesterday morning. There were four stars. Cross my heart. It's like someone had painted them into the sky. Four stars. One, two, three, four, all on top of each other. And it turns out that they're not stars at all, that it's actually a planetary, what they call a, a planetary parade. Sky Guide said it's actually Jupiter, Venus, Mars and Saturn all in a row. So I looked it up and it's the last time it happened was about like 947 AD or something so like that. A thousand years ago. A thousand years ago. And it won't happen again for a thousand years. Pretty impressive, guys. Don't miss out on it. It's like I said... It's once in a lifetime thing, once in a thousand year thing yeah. where you have those four. And when you see it, it's quite breathtaking. So today we're going to talk about uh, training, of course, but we, we're going to talk about supplementary training. That's correct. And I think the, the phrase supplementary kind of tells you exactly what it is. It's, you know, in the dojo, we have a certain amount of time and we train by doing a certain range of movements. And then some people think, well, I'm going to do extra training, so they'll do another 1,000 punches or 2,000 or whatever they do, okay? So we wanted to discuss how important it is to approach this idea of supplementary training in a far more intelligent way so that the training actually does become supplementary. Does that make sense? I think so. So I think um, if you see training in the as a, a kind of a, a specific training. Ultimately, you know, the, the hard kumite and everything is very, it doesn't get more specific than that. That's what you're there for. Yeah. And the kihon and everything else you're doing in the dojo is designed for that. But I think you've got to balance it out. Is that a fair call? I think so. I, I, th I definitely think so. And I talk to you guys today all as a coach, not so much as because most of you are uh, you know, hierarchically and more experienced than me in the karate side of things. But as a coach, talking to athletes, um, yes, that is absolutely the case. I defer to Mitch's experience all the time, unless, of course, he says something I disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> and then I set him down for 50. <laughs> but I, I mean, serious. we need to realise that the whole objective of supplementary training is to supplement, supplement your training. The main training. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's, it's really important. So... Not to replace it. Exactly. You don't want to not miss... to repeat it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So is it fair if I was to put this to you, Mitch? Is it fair to ask yourself, what is the exact objective of the training that you're planning? Yeah, absolutely. What do you think um, is a good approach to that? Well, I think a good a great approach to it is based on your goals. It's it's very important. We in the dojo, obviously the, the Xian or Sensei or Senpai who's taking the training does the, the training and obviously customizes as much as possible to the group that's in front of him or her. However, it cannot be completely individualized largely because it is a group thing. People are doing X amount of rounds, doing so. It is, it is individualized in certain parts, but the overall it'll be pretty similar for most people. So the opportunity that we have with supplemental training is that we can individualize it and make it a little bit more specific to us so that we get certain needs met. Because just as a really broad example, I might be a real puncher and Xian might be a kicker. For example, so he might need to work on his punches more. I might need to work on my kicks more. Just something as basic as that, rudimentarily. And so in our supplemental training, they might be the focus. That's just a really broad place to start. But also I would suggest that there are some really important principles that everyone needs to adhere to at the same time. For yeah. example, I'm just always on about the number one rule is go home injured. And the last thing you want to do is in your supplementary training get injured get injured yes and i can speak with direct experience because when i did my um, stairs i did a set of stairs uh, one january first on every january first i used to do a an insane workout and this one was probably more insane than others and as a result to this day i have a funky knee as a result so whilst whilst some training may very well work work the mind and the the courage and your ability to 
push on under adverse duress. conditions, duress. You, there is a, a time when you need to back off and go, well, no, I don't want to get injured. Is that fair? Uh, absolutely. And it, some people wear injuries as a badge um, and you don't I, – I, ideally you don't want that to be the case. You want to in, do training to ensure that your next session can be better and then you have longevity in training. One of the beautiful things about Kyokushin Karate and a lot of martial arts is you can do them forever. Well, nothing no annoys me more than people who just – when you see them, all they want to talk about is their injury because I'm so busy talking about my injury. <laughs> I just hate it when they interrupt. <laughs> How can I tell them about my shoulder? How can I injury? slip it in when they're taking off? Why? Uh, you know, yeah. The nerve of them. But yeah. anyway. Yeah, so we want to make our supplemental training. Um, obviously, you want to do things that enhance your ability to, to, to do karate in this case or whatever the sport is as, when I talk to different athletes, but in this case, Kyokushin Karate. And then secondly, you want to do things that, and, and one of the things, the, the point to that is to balance up um, the train that Kyokushin typically gives us. And when you think about it, you know, our upper body kihon particularly is beautiful. There's a great balance in that. Our lower body kihon, the, the, the kicks um, that we do, uh, are very anterior dominant. Hip flexors and quads get a lot of use compared to the posterior chain. So straight away, there's an opportunity to balance that up, balance up the posterior chain. So is that a fair call? You were talking before about... Um asking what the purpose is if you want to simplify things and i'm really big about simplifying things because the older i get the simpler it has to be but is it fair to say all right well then as a general rule let's look at training that balances the content of your dojo training absolutely mm -hmm. yeah what are some exercises look there's heaps there's a lot of philosophies around it and some exercise so one of the philosophies is um just the intensity, for example, if you're doing really intense training in the dojo regularly, your non-specific training, you, the yin and yang, you might have to balance that out and do a lot more stretching. For example, it doesn't get t enough time in a lot of dojos. And then um, do some exercises in a way that uh, um, help that, for, as, just as an example. Um, One then, area that you've brought to my attention before I started to train with you a lot, uh, I never really understood the degree that we minimize hip flexor stretching i we do some hip flexor stretching in the dojo but it's yep. probably a hundredth of what we really need to do yeah i couldn't agree more as i sort of mentioned earlier the kicking kihon just as an example in, we have lines of movement Ian king has this concept called lines of movement and basically there's four planes in the upper body there's horizontal push and then horizontal pull so in, from a karate point of view we've got the punching hand which is the push, and we've got the hikate, the retracting hand, that's the pull. So we get some natural horizontal push-pull with that. We've also got vertical push-pull. So we've got vertical push like a shoulder press and a vertical pull like a chin-up or a lateral pull-down, which don't get any, really done in karate at all. So there's an opportunity in your non-specific training or supplemental training to expose our bodies to those lines of movement to keep the shoulder healthy. Because if we just do certain planes and we don't give it all ranges, the body begins to seize up. Essentially, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? That, um, that saying has been yeah. around forever. Yeah. From a kicking point of view, um, if you just pull the camera down, because I can't kick that high. <laughs> if, from, a kick, yeah, lower, lower. <laughs> from a kicking point of view, obviously, if we're, we're doing Maki uh, we're doing Gizagiri, we're doing Washigiri, and so on, Yokogiri, um, that's all, if you look at it, it's hip flexion, it's hip flexion, it's knee extension. That's basically nearly all the kicks, even the, the yoko gary, it's hip flexion and you get some abduction out to the side, but it's essentially hip flexion and still extension of the knee happening. Um, Yushiro gary is one of the few, there's still a hip flexion, but we get hip extension there. It's one of the few muscles that we get hip extension with. So, so just from a purely balance point of view in your kion, if you're doing a lot of this, you know, all the main kiyagis, um, we should do the, I don't know if you want to talk about the countdown soon, but we should do with it. Uchideshi days, but to balance that up would be essentially doing a lot of Yushiro Gary to get this line of movement because we've got quad dominant exercises that use the front of the leg and hip dominant exercises that use the posterior chain or back of the leg. So that's a little start from a Keon point of view. We want to balance that up as much as possible. So is it, I was just thinking when you're saying that, one of the things that I used to do when I was younger is kind of lean against the wall like this and just work the like these. So I get the adductors 
and some hip extension. And the hip extension, and then work the hooks. Yes. Hook kicks like that. Yep. We don't get a chance to do that in the dojo at all. No. Um, but they're really, from a technical viewpoint, because most supplementary training is very non specific. But some good supplementary training that is very specific is this idea of just using the wall to steady yourself and then just work the idea, working these lines of movement that you may not normally do. Yes. Is that as bad as, is that as, bad as it feels? No, it's <laughs> fantastic. So um, that's a really good, that's something you can do. We actually just lean. This sort of movement to open up the hips and lines of movement that you wouldn't normally That's use. right. Because everything is so here. It's so here. It's one of the reasons Chokushin guys and girls are some of the best kickers in the world. I mean, there's no denying that at all. However, to balance it up from an injury prevention point of view and keep ourselves being able to kick long term, we want to do the opposite. So hip extension type thing. So in actual karate, one of the ways you can balance it up is uh, we used to do... Um, like we finish the key on we finish on Jordan Moshi Gary, we do 50 or 60 yeah. or 100, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, and so one of the ways to do that would be in your own key on supplemental training to do a lot more you share Gary, just as an example to help balance that up. Now you're not going to entirely balance it up, but you'll go start making inroads in that direction. Sure. I think that's um really valuable to talk about that. Uh and then of course, um I think karate generally speaking, let me just bring this back to us. Karate, generally speaking, everything is you're moving forward. And one exercise, which I think I'm only speculating, but it gave me a lifelong sense of balance in my um, training was when I was a kid, I actually for a long time used to row to school. Row? I used to row my yeah. boat to school and I lived for rowing. My dad, we had an old rowing boat. It wasn't, it was a, an old style construction, so heavy wood rowing boat. But my dad actually bought me sculling oars with the curves and everything. And as a little boy, I just used to infatuate because I push. I had a little bar in it to push off my feet. I didn't understand rowing, but I used to love rowing. And I didn't realize how great an exercise it was until I started flying as a flight attendant and I go to all the hotels around the world and they have the life rower and I jump on the rowing machine and I challenge the Olympic level 20 minute record and I had my name on all the records until some guy from Lufthansa, I swear, he was probably <laughs> Gant from Lufthansa he used to follow me around and smash my records and he was probably six foot five and a rowing champion. But anyway, the point, point I'm getting is that rowing exercise it's got to be good right it's so good it's insane and it's one of the biggest imbalances i mean i've harped on about it on these youtube lives for a while now everyone's probably sick of it but it's so important it's insane that we um externally rotate this bone the humerus so we do this to it and our scapulas we would have more retraction because everything's here it the, the, the kyokushin kion is so beautifully balanced with the hikite retracting hand however as soon as you start doing some kumite drills, you start doing bag work, pad work, sparring, it all comes here. So we, yes. need to re we need to reverse that in our training, not so much because it gives us a performance enhancement effect, but because it helps keep our shoulders injury free so we can continue to perform. And this is, this is not respected enough until you're injured. And then all of a sudden it becomes a real priority. So and then when you get injured, what happens is the... the exercise therapist and the physio and the, they're all telling you to do these strange exercises that yeah. you've been minimizing all these years that's right yeah. so there should be all these rehab type exercises and they're now called prehab but they ideally are all part of your training all the time don't wait until you're injured it's like insurance it's an insurance policy in healthy future training rather than um, waiting until you know you're busted and then trying to get fixed again yeah that's a fair call <laughs> i like cycling too mike i like cycling as a as if you could do one form of exercise, I like cycling an old person because it's non-weight bearing, so it gives your knees a chance to exercise without having to deal with the forces of gravity so much. Yeah. But with the karate, because every, all the kicks are using the hip flexors, what would be a good balancing exercise? 
other than the back kicks and so yep. on. So th before we even go there, you've got to look at the motor contraction as well. So what's happening here? This is a this is a contraction of the hip flexors. You know all this stuff that goes on. So what do we want to do? That's a shortening and a t and a contraction. So the first thing we want to do is reverse that. We want to lengthen and loosen. So we want to spend our time in hip flexor stretching, an enormous amount compared to what most people think about. Um, if you're training hard and, and training regularly through the week, if you're not doing it, say on roughly maybe an hour of hip flexor stretching current, uh, cumulatively through the week you're probably not helping yourself long term. Can you show us some sample hip flexors? Yeah, sure. You think so th there's this one that we've done before. Basically, um, you're in this type of position here. This is a very common stretch. Um, everything's at 90 degrees. So I'm 90 degrees here. My knee's at 90 degrees. My back leg is at 90 degrees. It's not, it's not there. It's at 90 degrees. And there's some variations of things you can do here. So you can put a little pelvic tilt on. Uh, which is a little rooting movement tilting the bottom of the pelvis forwards, and that helps stretch the front of the hip flexor. Then you can put the stretch side arm up and pull it across, which helps stretch the hip flexor. Can you do it like 40 degrees the angle? Oh, of the sorry. Arm? Yeah. So you see, bringing the arm across there like that. Just like a wrestling S grip is what I'd use there. But you don't want to lean forward and have the hip back, right? Not yet. Um, and then eventually you can. So you can go front foot forward. Keep the trunk vertical and then go forward as an example but what i mean by leaning forward i mean oh here yeah no yeah we want our hip under our spine basically all the time and the back leg extended and then you can do those same variations with the rear foot up all the same variations with the rear foot up i prefer to use something like a i prefer to use something like a um a bench or a chair so in those positions i have i have my foot on a bench or a chair or could a you chair. do a say against the glass See how Mitch puts his foot against the wall there. And I start here, low, and then and as the body loosens, come up. If you go straight here and you're not used to it, it can be pretty intense for the body. So you've got to work to your level. Good one. And start here. And spend time in these positions. So this is not feeling my quads, hip flexors, and so on. You can go forward. You can spend time in these positions. Some people might need to pad the knee significantly because this is a pretty hard surface. Spend time in these positions. That's the number one thing to reverse um, the, the, the stimulus that kicking gives us, to be able to kick long term. I know that you've been working on a, an article yep. on gluteal exercises. Well, just talking about these concepts, because um, someone mentioned it actually on a live the other day that, you know, doing leg extensions for Moshigeri and then uh, leg curls for um bull kick yeah. right and it is true like those things are definitely true but only if you're looking at the knee at the knee joint you've got that and you've got that but if you look at the hip joint the hip joint in a washigari is there the hip joint in a sure uh, in a hook kick is there so it's almost identical it's, it's identical yeah. so if you look at the hip if you do that if you think okay great what happens is we're still over we're still dominating the hip and we're not doing anything for the glute the, the, the support leg there is some action in the glute. One of the things you can do, you can put your hands on your bum cheeks here and do, do some front kicks, do some washing areas just as an example. And you can feel the support legs glutes doing some work, but it's not enough to counter the stimulus that kicking gives us. Yeah. So very, very important to do some gluteal exercises. I know when uh, I'm being slack, one of the first things to drop off is um, abdominal training. Is that important as well? It's everything. <clears throat> it's so, so important. It's not funny, abdominal exercises. Um, it's incredibly underdone. And typically abdominal exercises are, um, you know, Kyokushin people are very strong in their abdominals because of the, the sturdiness, physical quality you talk mm. about. So we get punched in the guts a lot. Mm. And then also the amount of sit-ups and conditioning. I mean, there are grading requirements, right? Mm. There's certain targets you've got to hit and push up, sit-up, mm. squats, jumps, um, mm. jumping the belt, or mm. that type of thing. So really important but there's more than just one or two lines of movement for the abdominals and this is what's key so typically in abdominal training if we just put it down the in karate it'll be here it'll be basically this type of thing or it'll be you know this type of thing yeah as an example but there's other lines of movement that are important you know there's the um this you know the leg when you grab the leg right you push down there so leg raises, but they hit hip flexors a lot too, right? Yeah. And I throw the legs yeah, different directions. Different directions, throw the legs down. 
And Mitch has to then deal with that force, the gravitational force pulling down as well. Yes. That's a great exercise. It's a great exercise. And it's reiterating the kicking side of things. So it's a, it's a, it's a pro kicking exercise. That sort of exercise. Yeah, I enjoy that. Yeah, it's a great exercise, and especially because you're doing it as a triangle, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so it becomes a uh, abdominal exercise, but it's actually a technique like shadow boxing. Yeah, it's it. Right, so, so it has a degree of specificity yeah, as well. Yeah, it should because you'll treat those muscles to do that. Yeah. But still, if you look at what you're doing for hip flexors. Yes, you're closing the hip flexors. You're not. It's more of that. So this is why the hip flexor stretching and quad stretching, etc., becomes so important. Because we're doing it all the time in jiu-jitsu, we're here, you know, we're here, we're getting the elbow, we're, we're doing all these things all the time. Now, for as far as abdominals go, there's other lines of movement. There's drills like, um, well, we call them thin tummy drills, but there's drills for the lower abdominal and transverse abdominals, which don't, which look like I'm doing nothing, but I'm basically contra isometrically contracting my transverse abdominals here. And this is what it is, and then relax. Now, they're a tough drill, they can be a challenge to learn, so, um, not going to be able to put it on YouTube. It's something that's usually done a bit more in person. There's other lines of movement too, things like this, like lateral leg lower, you know, going down this way and coming up. If that's too much, you go down this way, bend the knees. Look at the thumb. Yeah. And when, if you keep your eye on your thumb, it actually forces you to take your neck to a set range of motion, which otherwise you wouldn't do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a great addition, yeah. So they're, they're key, but it, again, it comes down to making sure the side of the foot touches the ground, the opposite shoulder is anchored, as Shian said, look at the thumb with the head, you need neck range, and then coming up. That can be too much for some people, so start here. So that's another different line of movement for abdominals, if that makes sense. Then you've got these types of things, you know, like the, the push-up hole type things, or planks, as they're uh, regularly called. called um, there's, you, you, you already mentioned, flights, like just going straight up and holding the isometric for five to ten seconds and then coming down to train our lower abdominals. Um, and it's, the other thing that's very important with abdominal training too that doesn't happen in karate, but it's, it's so important that with all supplemental training is the speed of movement. The speed of movement is a, a variable of training that's critical that we manipulate. So we have, in, in karate, typically the sit ups are itch, knee, Sun, like which is great, but it's like push ups. You know, you see a lot of guys in training, bitch, e, you know, they're not the greatest. No. <laughs> if, I, if I can make a broad statement, yeah. they're not the greatest. And then, so what we can do is we can manipulate the speed of movement to change things. So, for example, you can do, you know, a five second lower, bitch, me, sun, chi, go, pause, and then come up, bitch, me, sun, chi. Go, pause, and come up. And you do the same thing with abdominals. Doing these quick sit ups, you do slow ones, just as an example. You always take five or six seconds to come up. Slow, 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 slow. And then down over five or even ten seconds. Doing these slow speed, these slow speed reps. These are all variables we can do in our supplemental training. As an instructor, of course, you can incorporate them into your dojo. I'd say the main constraining challenge is how much time you have. Yeah. If you did the amount of training you had to do, or if one did the amount of training one has to do, no, the dojos would be empty because it'd be like, and it makes sense why Mass Oyama, the old days, the training sessions used to go for five or six hours sometimes. You know, because they did everything in those training sessions. Yeah. And then, of course, it got to the point where it's impractical for most people to do a five or six hour session every day. So they started to drop them back. And now I've even talked about um, the potential and, and benefit of even just one hour sessions. So in the dojo, you're doing one hour of very specific training in the in the dojo. But you need to supplement that outside of the dojo with everything you're not getting done. Yes. So I always work on the idea that the instructor's role is to teach the student how to train. The student's role is to get out there and do it. Train, yeah. Yeah. And I think there's one other thing I'd like to mention is the inverse sort of relationship between the technical 
um, activity that you're doing, try, primarily training for, and then the supplemental training that you might do. So the more technical the training that needs to be done, for example, in Kyokushin, there's how many kata is there that in total? What, Roughly 20. 20 kata, and then there's all the Aido Kion, then there's all the um, Kihon, and then there's all the technique works and all the combinations and all, you know, working out your own karate, mm -hmm. as you say, from sort of brown belt and above. There's a lot of technical technique in a lot of that. But the other challenge with it is that people sometimes people go out and they'll go, oh, well, what I'll do is I'll just get a really big bench and a really big squat and I'm becoming big and strong and I'll just, I'll just nail people. That, that's what will do it for me. And that'll work to a point, to a certain level of opponent, but then you've seen it a million times more than me. <laughs> There's someone else who's just as big and strong naturally but technically superior and then it doesn't end well. But the thing too is society, well, the, the health and fitness industry kind of pushes you towards that. You see, you have power lifting contests, who can lift the heaviest, uh, who has the better body build. You don't have uh, a flutter contest. No. <laughs> How are you going with your flutters? Show me your flutters, Mitch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. my flutters are killing it at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I've just my scapular attraction is just out on of fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it, it's not attractive. Yeah, there's no incentive. Sell. Yeah, there's, there's no right. incentive, societal, societal incentive. So it's and one one of the great things in martial arts, obviously, though, is the ego and removing it so that we can do these things. And that's where I was about to go with it. Shyam was talking about like there's so much video online about a powerlifter. And Sensei Mike talked about you know one exercise rowing was one of the best, and I totally agree with it. From a strength training point of view, well, the one or two exercises, if you couldn't do anything else, what would you do? For me, to be a snatch or a clean and jerk, which are the two Olympic lifts. They're such beautiful lifts. They start from the floor, from here, or wide grip if it's a snatch, right? They start from here. And here's something you'll notice straight away is in karate, we're here, shortening the hip flexor, right? But in the snatch and the power clean, we're starting. It's a, we're stretching the posterior chain muscles. They're the ones that are working first, right? And we get the ability to jump as well, so I'll do this a little bit quicker. So in a snatch, for example, we start here, really bent over, leg, 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 it's all posterior chain, back support, upper traps, upper back, and then we have this movement, catch, and we stand up. It's a beautiful posterior chain exercise, it's magic. And same as the, the, the clean as well, so from here we're going clean, 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 jump, catch, here, and then we're here, or we're doing a squat, um, squat press, depending on what you want to do. But those two exercises are typically considered advanced, but they're actually, you can do them with a bar or no bar, drilling, and they're such wonderful exercises to balance up what we have in Kyokushin Karate. If I could just pick two, there's a whole bunch of other ones as well, but they're just for a lot of sports to balance up. Because if you look at the back and the legs of Olympic lifters, even the lighter weight divisions, you do not see more developed glutes, erector spinae, upper traps, upper back, Man, these guys are, and they're so powerful. The Japanese concept, the Shingi Tai, and if you haven't read Sensei Mike's book, it's a fantastic book, but Shingi Tai, the mind, the technique, and the body. Masoyama says that Shin, the mind of the Japanese martial arts, essentially originates in India with the breathing exercises and the focus on meditation. Gi, or the technique, essentially originates in China. But the Japanese approach to physical culture is quite interesting and unique. And it's interesting that Mitch says that you look at Olympic lifters and it's the, the glutes and the, the spinal erectors and everything which are incredibly developed. In Japanese society, it's not the guys with the big V shape that gets the attention. It's the ones with the powerful thighs, the powerful glutes, yeah. the strong back that draws attention yeah that is and from an athletic point of view the olympic lifts are just beautiful brilliant lifts to balance up a lot of the lower body um kihon training in kyokushin karate as well as a lot of other sports but we're talking about kyokushin now so um i cannot stress the importance of them enough and all the exercises that are supplemental to them clean pulls snatch pulls all that kind of stuff but pulling from the ground dead and so on done well and i'm hesitant to say deadlift because so many of them are done poorly it's it's, it it's pains insane. me to say it, if that makes yeah. sense, but yeah, those exercises, because they're doing the exact opposite to what the Kihon's doing, where we're training the hip extensors. It's the hip extensors that are working here, the exact opposite to the kicking muscles that help our pelvis 
and the muscles around our hips have balance front and back, which is just everything to longevity and training. So there you go. We just wanted to highlight to everyone how important it is not to think that everything you need happens in the dojo because it doesn't. The instructor's job is primarily, well, to teach a technique and to develop good technique, you need to condition the body, you need to condition the somatics and that takes supplementary training and that training needs to be formed around that question, what is the purpose of your training? And if it's to supplement your karate, it means you're not just simply repeating the same thing over, which means you're ignoring the opposite. You actually need to focus your supplementary training on the opposite chains, the opposite muscle, muscle, muscular mo motion and so on. Contraction type, speed of movement, all of these things. It's a whole separate entity and I'm not suggesting everyone go down a rabbit hole with it but just the basics can help enormously long term and I'd just like to say one thing quickly as well we've talked about the physical um, supplemental training but what about the technical supplemental training to Kyokushin you're the master of the, you're the master of this with you the different ranges because Kyokushin's essentially range one and two of your five ranges and you spend and you've spent decades in the other ranges to give Kyokushin the balance it needs. I have a deadly little finger. I've done all my supplemental training. What I can do with that little finger is out of this world. And it's, <laughs> um, I was keeping it a secret, but I guess the secret's out. Yeah, look, I think it's really important that you you can't deny, you can't ever ignore Shingi Tai, the mind, the technique, and the body, and all of those levels have supplementary training. They all have. Probably, particularly the mind, we, in Kyokushin, we tend to think that the mind training built around courage and all this sort of thing comes from hard kumite, and it does, but there's the flip side to that too. You need to be able to uh, bring your mind down and centre in a state of calmness and peace as well. So the supplementary training needs to understand the importance of quietness and the importance of, of stillness and meditation. Uh, and then the technical training is the best way to supplement. Again, if you're physical training, you supplement by doing the things that are kind of opposite to what you're doing in the dojo. For technical training, it's the same. When you're doing technical training, it never hurts to supplement your technical training with training that you don't even do in the dojo. Namely range three, range four, range, range five. five. Yeah. And it only serves to enhance your stand-up training. So you have the mental balance, yin and yang. You have the technical balance, the opposite to what you're doing. We're, we're really good at punching and kicking, but how we, if someone grabs us, how we, if someone lies on top of a straight arm. Yeah, right. that sort of thing. Yeah. That's the biggest thing in the world. If you want to see how crazy difficult it can be, just put on gloves and put on a head shield and get your training partner just a stiff arm and hold you right like that. It's insane if you haven't worked on how to deal with it. Guys, I hope you got something out of that. It's really important that you understand, you, you need to ask yourself, what is the purpose of my training? What is the goal of every session? We, we, in the dojo, we call it the quintessential question. Is what I am doing right now the best thing I can do to reach my goal, to play my role, and to live above the line. And that's what you can do with every training session is, what is my goal here? What is my purpose? I'm not just going down and doing a countdown, push-up, sit-up, squats, beautiful exercises. If you did push-up, sit-ups, and squats until you're 80, you're going to be a fit 80-year-old. There's no doubt about it. But you need to ask yourself, what is the purpose? All right? Every time you do that, how do I avoid injury? What is what I'm doing here safe? And is it going to develop the areas of my own training that uh, not? Yeah, and right. to just give a practical example, a couple of Xi'an's younger black belts I'm helping, they helped me with the grappling side of things and I helped them with the physical preparation side of things. And yesterday, um, one of them was over training with me and we, we finished our grappling session. And after I took him through cleans and clean pull variations because he's done so many squats and jump squats and Kihon and um, Meikiyagi's and so on, but he needs to develop these other qualities physically 
in order for him to stay square so he can train long term because he's only in his early 20s. Mm. So we, these are injury prevention and long term mm. ways of looking at things. Good on you. Mitch, thank awesome. you. Thank you very much. Like I said, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Probably couldn't have said any of that myself. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Awesome. See you next week.